Hello and welcome to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast, a show about life adversity, how to overcome it and transform your life. This is your host, Dr. Lidiana Garcia, a licensed psychologist in Los Angeles, California. And even though my hope is to deliver information that can be helpful for you to overcome adversity and transform your life, it is not meant to be a substitute for being diagnosed and treated by a licensed mental health, medical, and related professional. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode. Today, I have the privilege to introduce you to Andrea Vargas. She's a licensed mental health counselor in South Florida. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, I was so looking forward for this episode, especially now as I'm expecting a second one. So this one is like a little, you know, I'm like, I need this for me too. It's a treat for you. (laughs) Treat for me. Okay. So tell us, please tell us a little bit about you, the work that you do. Okay. I am also a registered play therapist, actually a registered play therapist supervisor. I am a qualified supervisor for mental health counseling interns, and I'm certified in first play. I've been specializing in children and adolescents since 2006. My practice is in Western Florida, which is in South Florida, and I see children 0 to 21, so college students are included there as well. I... I have been doing play therapy since I found out what play therapy was. And the first play, which is the the therapeutic infant massage, is a play therapy that focuses on infants zero to two. And with working with children, I've learned that everything stems from the attachment with the parents. So attachment work, adoption especially is a passion of mine. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, I was looking at your bio and about that piece about ad- adoption. That is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the work that you do. I don't work with zero to five, <laughs> <laughs> but I've taken here and there some play therapy kind of trainings that I found that they're so helpful and they're, you know, it's so amazing the work that zero to five therapists do because it's so important. That's why this whole season is about is that those zero to five years Mm -hmm. are so crucial and people keep sometimes minimizing it and not taking it into consideration, but starting from the get-go with infant. Wow. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It's really fun. And like you said, it's very crucial because when we think about it, that's where everything all starts. And if we have an overall positive experience from zero to five, it makes us a little stronger and more resilient to dealing with whatever life throws at us later on. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this season is also, I was like in the introduction to it, telling people that it's not only like if you have an infant, because some people might be like, well, I don't have an infant. I don't need that. But it's important to listen to this episode as well from that perspective of reparenting if you are in that stage. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, also be open for those of you that are listening and might not have any children or your children might be older, just to listen from that reparenting perspective in terms of what are these things that you can apply to yourself. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's so important that you say that because the more that I've learned about attachment, my intake sessions have changed so much, even with older kids. I really focus on I would say a good portion of my intake with families is finding out about the pregnancy, the birth, the delivery, and those first two years. And sometimes parents forget about things that have happened. And as they're telling me, it's so amazing. Like their eyes open up and they're like, oh, you know, I'm like, there you go. You get it now. So, so cool. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's go into it. So, so what is the infant massage technique? Like, what is that? Okay, so there are a lot of providers that do infant massage. And this is a little different because it actually was created by a psychologist who, is, who was able to combine theories of, attach, of, of the attachment theory and then the developmental play therapy. And so she actually created this beautiful story that goes along with the massage and It's so, so cool. It's called the baby tree hug. And the 
practitioner um, models for the parent how to do the massage and go through the story while the practitioner has a baby doll. It's pretty life-size and it's so funny because when I've done it in the past, I have the baby doll in front of me. I don't touch the baby, like the actual baby. The mother touches the baby, her baby. And the baby kind of turns his head and looks at the doll like, wow, that is really, that's a really creepy baby because it doesn't move. But if they're, they're so fascinated by the fact that they, it's like exactly the same size as most of the infants that I've worked with. So I would just guide the parents into the, uh, with the story and teach them how to do the different parts of the massage. It's like a full body massage, like from head to toe. And then you turn the child over. Also, it's on the back. And it's just a really beautiful story to go along with that. And I find that it is most helpful with parents who have uh, brought their, home, their child home after being in the NICU, like preemies, because most parents, and I think understandably so, have been so traumatized by everything that has you know, happened after delivering their baby that they don't want to hurt the child anymore. Like they don't, something they don't even know if they should touch it. And as we know, touching is super, super important in attachment and for the development, physical, emotional development of that child. So in preemies, also in adoption, when, when there's an infant adoption or even it's designed from zero to two, but I had mentioned earlier before we started recording that even children that are like two or three, they can still benefit because when there's a trauma, they, they still need that. They still need like a little, a lot of that extra baby, babying that they might have missed out for whatever reason. And of course, new moms who just want to do how first moms are, they just want to do everything for the first one, right? And yeah, so, oh, very important also for mothers who have suffered from postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety to give them an opportunity to kind of re redo some moments that maybe they weren't so present. This is so important. And for those of the listeners that might be asking a baby massage, like, they're not stressed. <laughs> they don't need like that self-care. Can you expand a little bit on the importance of touch? Yes. So going back to the attachment theory, right? There was an experiment that was done with the monkeys. Therapists that are listening, they probably remember this from grad school. And they had divided the monkeys up into different cages. And one babe, one monkey had a wired... So this was like a wire mother, right? It was like a, um, they had created like a mother and then the monkey would get the milk or the food from the wire. But then there was another monkey that had the, the wire covered in cloth. So it was more comforting. So even if the wired mom monkey was providing the food, they still wouldn't stay there. They would only go there for the food and they would go to the one with the cloth. So that was where like a lot of the attachment theory kind of stemmed from because we, as people, as adults, as teenagers, we, we need touch. That's how, that's so, so important in development. You know that even in, in adults that are in the hospital, they've, they've done studies where they've received massages and they actually got better than those, uh, got better quicker or maybe even better than the patient who didn't receive any, any massage or, or any touch. So touch is important for, for humans, for human development. Yeah, so, so important. And there's also a lot of research in the Soviet countries, like back in the day, in terms of all those orphanages and the mm -hmm. children that were not being held. Yes. Would die. So that's, yes. also, you know, it's, Touch is such an important, that's why there's this movement about carrying your baby, like baby mm -hmm. wearing and all those yeah. kind of things. And maybe people are yeah. like, I don't want them to be too attached. So, but it's so important, that piece of touch. Yes, yes. And it's interesting. I like that you bring that up because there has been a change in the way we're looking at touch because for a while, I mean, if we look at when like years in the prehistoric or like really long time ago, right? We see the cavemen, that's how they carried their babies. So this was some, and in some countries to this day, they still carry their babies like that. 
there's a lot of cold sleeping in other cultures that we don't see so much anymore. And it's interesting because it's this thing that happened when we started having news, when we started having, like, they were presenting the news on TV or on the radio, we started hearing about cases of sexual abuse. And then touch became this thing that we don't do anymore. We can't touch, you know, at, at school, like, teachers are paranoid to, like, hug a child or even a therapist. I mean, I, I was in grad school in, like, early 2000s. And they would tell us, like, just be careful. And now we're seeing, no, if a child hugs you, like, you hug them back and, like, you give them high fives. And you, it definitely has changed the way that we're starting, we're, we're looking at touch, thankfully. Thankfully. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, this is, yeah. In, in the Latino culture, in the Latinx culture, there's this whole thing, like, in Spanish, there's a term, which we'll discuss in the Spanish episode, but it's kind of uh, don't do it because they will get used to. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also um, the way we live right now. It's so different. And so many moms have to go back to work, unfortunately, so soon mm-hmm. that a lot of time that whole attachment parenting from how what people kind of hear out there, which is more like being close and all those things and maybe co-sleeping and all that. Some parents are like, but I need to leave my child very early on in daycare. So I need to get them used to not being so close to me and it's so sad because so many people take that in very black and white Mm -hmm. and then they go into that other extreme of no I'm not gonna baby where I'm only gonna put in the crib from the get-go all those kind of so yeah yeah definitely and there is a misconception because again I think there was I don't remember his name but there I think he was a psychologist maybe he wasn't even a psychologist but he said something like let it cry or let a baby cry it out and that you know he said that and a lot of people just assume that that's true. And that's like not what you're supposed to do. If you carry your baby or you baby your baby, I can promise you that they're not going to be 18 still trying to sleep with you. Instead, the more that they're attached to you, the more confident they feel. And when they are growing and they get, they get older, they're more independent because they feel confident. If they don't if you don't provide that early on, then there's an insecurity that develops within them. And insecure people do not feel confident to do things and they're not the most independent. So it's like this whole misconception, unfortunately. And that is super important because when I remember when I became a first time mom, and I mean, I'm a psychologist, and even though I don't specialize in zero to five, I did take a lot of developmental classes and overall about attachment and all those kind of things. And I remember like nobody necessarily talking about that aspect of having a child being kind of on you and sometimes depending also on your own trauma history can be too much. And some parents and and then other people are like, oh, you're like, there's a term for that right now. I can remember the name, but like you're doing too much and then you won't have any independence. And there's this whole idea of the more independent a child is, that's a good baby. If the baby sleeps through the night, the baby sleeps on on, on their own, if the baby eats on their own, you know, as fast as they potty train, that is what is valued for the majority. And it's so sad because for parents that are not doing that, sometimes they go into these places that then people start criticizing them. Because I remember feeling like, wait, what is okay? And also like as a new mom, knowing that when you're doing this new type of parenting, there will be a longer time that you might not necessarily feel that independent. And that's not necessarily the goal here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's very confusing for first-time moms. There's so many different opinions, but I think I've always spoken to, or whenever I speak to parents and we talk about those first, that first year, the second year, or even if they have infants coming in when to come to see me, it's almost like their gut always tells them, pick up the baby. And then there's like, oh no, but I've been told not to. Or my mother-in-law was looking at me like, no, you got to leave them, you know? And it's like, go with your gut. Your gut tells you, pick up the baby, pick up your baby. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've overall talked about the benefits, but can you summarize some of the most, or the benefits that you love the most about the infant massage technique? Okay. Well, the infant massage technique has a lot of physical benefits. Like it helps with digestion. It helps with co-regulation, which is really important. These are the kids that later can regulate themselves, their emotions better. And a piece of the infant first play 
massage is that the practitioner also focuses on the mother. You, you're not going to go do a massage on a baby when you're super stressed out because that's not going to be the right time to do it. Your baby's going to feel your stress. And at the same time, teaching the parents how to be more attuned to their baby. If their baby is sick or is fussy, like too fussy, that's not a good time to do the, the massage portion of it. So it, it teaches parents how to do, how to be more attuned to their baby and also more calm and relaxed. Like how, how for, I mean, it's hard, obviously, as a first time mom to be calm and relaxed, but how important that piece is. So there's the co-regulation, it helps with sleep. It helps with, because it has the story going, you know, along with it. And there's a lot of interaction and eye contact. And as you're saying the story, it's not going to be a monotone way. It's going to be like a fun way to say it. So your voice is singy songy and it's like fun and playful. And all of that helps with language development and brain development. So yeah, those are some of the benefits. I love all of this. And for the listeners that might not understand the term co-regulation, can you like define it in a simple way? Okay. okay, sure. So as adults, for the most part, when we become upset, we know how to calm ourselves down, right? And we learned this from when we were infants. If our parent was not good at regulating themselves, it makes it really hard for a child to learn how to regulate themselves. And even as adults, right, we seek co-regulation. When we come home from a hard day or a stressful day at work, we want the person that we're talking to about our job or our issue, whatever, how good does a hug feel? Like, do you just need a hug? And then that, you know, that is co-regulating, right? And when they're not there, you know what to do to soothe yourself. So it's basically soothing, soothing yourself. Yeah, this is so important because this is what later on doing adolescent years and then young adult is so needed to kind of manage your impulse control and all those kind of things. So it's a super important skill. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Where can people learn about this? Because I mean, I know you mentioned there's a story behind it that you kind of do while you're doing the massage. So if there's someone that is listening and does not have anyone nearby that is trained in it, because I bet, you know, there's a website to find practitioners that are trained in it, but where can people learn about it? Well, the program is starting out, so if there's no one nearby to do it yet, there, there will be soon. That is the psychologist who created this program. That's her goal. Yeah, so it, you're not going to find like how to do it online because it requires the practitioner to guide you through it. Once, if you do have somebody who provides this service, you'll get like the first session is an explanation of, of the approach of the program. And then the second one is when the practitioner meets with you and you'll get them the, the manual. The manual will have the story. It'll have all the background as to why it's important, when to do it. They do have the manual in English and Spanish and I think in Korean, if I'm not mistaken. So this is going to be like a worldwide thing. It's just starting out. But yeah, for now, it would be like the website and then hoping that we get this going because this is going to be such a cool and important movement, I think, for a lot of infants and benefits. Yeah. Yeah. But for those of you that probably don't have the access to it or anything in general, just touch because we're talking. So can you give us like a little recommendations of different things that parent can do? Because it's not the same as like hardcore I love my massage, deep uh -huh. shoes. So like uh -huh. overall different things, because some people might be like even feeling um, intuitive, uh, intuitive about where to touch and stuff like that. But in general, like, because we're talking here and stressing about the importance of touch. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that parents can start doing, even if they don't have the practitioner or the technique or the information? Okay. Well, I would say that when you're something very natural as when you're putting lotion on the baby right? That's something you can start out with the toes. It can't be too soft because that's not a massage, right? But then it can't be too firm. So you're going to have to kind of gauge it where it's just right. And you can tell by the baby's reaction, you know, and it could be, let's say, so maybe, let me give you an example. Okay, so the type of massage that you might get when you get your nails done on your hand, something like that. 
So it could be, you can do their feet, you can do their hands. And with the lotion, I think after, a, or yeah, like after a bath, that would be a good time. And then maybe you can sing a song as you're doing it. Maybe a song that maybe your mom sang to you or something, you know, all of our, all of our different cultures have like a little song and then you can just be, be playful and it doesn't have to be like very long because remember they're babies, so they don't have the attention span, but it could be, you know, a couple minutes as you're putting the lotion on, you know, that could be your special like massage with a song and make it like a, like part of your routine. And you'll notice that they're, the, the more you do it, they're going to respond to it because they're, remember like, oh, this is that fun time I get with mommy after, after my bath. So. Yeah. What is that piece so important about the song? Because I know even with the massage therapy technique, there is a song behind it. Which- yeah, because if we think about it, for the most part, when we are babies, the way that we play, I mean, it has to be with our caregiver. And these are songs. Like, I mean, I'm Colombian, so I was, I was probably, when I was little, they would sing Los Pollitos Dicen or something like that. So all of these are, play, these are first play, right? Because play therapy is more for three and up. But we're always playing, even with babies, like peekaboo is one. So think of something like that. Think of a song or, or maybe like make up a story or something that's cute and funny that you can do as you're doing the massage. And that piece is important because, as I mentioned before, one of the benefits of this program is it lays a foundation for language development, which is going to help them with their reading and their brain power. And it's fun. I mean, we connect when we have fun right? And if you do it, if you're getting the touch piece of it, and then you're getting the connection with the eye contact and the song and the playfulness, then right there, that's like gold. Yeah. And even for those of you that might not remember lullabies, like you can like YouTube songs, you can like Spotify, if you have whatever form that you use to listen to music, you can find lullabies. Even if you're not from US and you're like, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, so also my lullabies were in Spanish. So I know Mm -hmm. the poquito dicen. Uh-huh. So, you know, stuff like that, that you can find that. And at the beginning, you might just put the song and make it and then you can start singing, you know, as you get into it. But don't limit yourself because some people might be like, oh, I don't like singing or, you know. So there's different ways that you can do it. And then I'm even thinking for the reparenting part, how important it is for some people to just explore because many people put lotion on themselves or like cream and whatever to kind of like when they're doing that to be very conscious about it and notice mm-hmm. what happens, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that moment, I think most women, right, we take at least in the morning or at night to kind of just soothe ourselves and we put our lotion, maybe our face mask and our our taking off our makeup is a routine and we're taking care of ourselves, taking care of our bodies. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that would be a good time also to explore how does that feel when attuned to it? (laughs) Because it's different than putting the lotion and whatever, but like really like being like noticing how it feels in your hands and all that, like being mindful Mm -hmm. of it. And if there's anything like, oh, I don't like this or whatever. I mean, it could be for so many other different types of trauma, but just to be mindful of it. Mm -hmm. Those things might come up if you are having an infant. Right, which is why a lot of times this is where the psychotherapist piece comes in because we can explore that. Like, what is that about? Sometimes I can give an example, something, it didn't happen to me, but for another practitioner while we were doing the training is maybe the baby moves in a certain way that as an adult, you might think is inappropriate and that might trigger something. So, so definitely. So this is not necessarily a program that a practitioner would just do always by themselves. The person is already in therapy. This could be like a, like a complimentary thing that they can do and then feedback given to the other therapist like, oh, this came up for her or for him because we can also do this with dads or grandparents or whoever is going to be caring for the baby. Yeah, I think this is so important. What are your favorite recommendations for parents? I think we already did this one. Sorry, so Susanna, take that one. We already talked about how to implement it or start implementing. So can you name some resources, some books, and or even the website? For okay. The- so the website is called firstplayinfantmassage.com. Okay, great. Any other resources that people might just for their own, like any book that you might recommend for parents if they want to start learning about the importance of touch, attachment, like basic kind of information? So... Dr. Courtney's book, Touch in Child Counseling and Play Therapy. And then Dr. Courtney also did a book, 
for massage with older children so you can kind of get an idea of what that would look like for a baby. It's called the Magic Rainbow Hug, which is also a beautiful story. The massage would go on the back of the older child. Okay, cool. Where can people find you? Because some people might be like, I want you. <laughs> <laughs> you can look me up. Uh, my website is Andrea Vargas, MHC.com. I'm also on Instagram, same thing. My handle is Andrea Vargas LMHC, or on Facebook, Andrea Vargas LMHC. So all of them is the same. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, please direct it to me or to Andrea, and I will sure get her to answer it because I probably have no idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of new to this too. But so it was a pleasure having you, and I hope this was helpful for anyone, not only for the parents that have infant or older children, but also from that reparenting perspective, because in general, to reflect about touch in your life and how was that for you? And, you know, if there's anything about it in terms of like difficulties with touch and all those sort of, so to reflect on that. Any last thoughts, reflections that you might have, Andrea, for the listeners? Yes. Another part of the infant first play massage is that you that you ask for permission for the for for the massage right obviously the child is not going to be able to answer you but it's just a nice practice and also the touch is a gentle caring nurturing touch so we talk to kids about good touch and bad touch when they get older but then if we haven't made like an emphasis on good what is good touch you know then they won't know the difference so it, it's also almost like planting a little seed in that child to understand this feels good. This is a caring touch versus what's not. So, Which is super that. important because that is going to help to prevent down the road. Exactly. So yes, thank you again. And thank you for everyone for listening. Till thank next you time. for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for listening to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. If you like this episode, please make sure to review it and comment on it and share it with your friends and family. Until next time.